Angry women forced open gate to help pregnant mother. St. John Ambulance missed out on 2021 budget. And Dirio Power set to light up Port Moresby City. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for National MTV News. A group of Morbe women forcefully opened an access gate this morning to allow a medivac by Manolos Aviation to proceed as planned. Security guards of a provincial government business arm, Morbe Sustainable Investment, welded the gates earlier this week, preventing access to refuel and ambulances to medivac patients to the health facilities. While the chopper was transporting the patient, a mother with her dead baby still in her belly, the women forcefully broke open the welded gate. The chain that was welded to this gate by the security guards of a provincial government business arm, Morbe's sustainable investment on Monday, was removed at 10 a.m. today in lay by a group of women from Morbe. We are talking on behalf of our sister district. Our mothers are dying in the rural district. That's why we are here to open the gate. Now they want the casualty what they want the mama and car beginning in a beginning and dry because the fuel chopper and the block see fuel are here. He has to try back to Naja to refuel the goal of the It's the only access used during a medivac by Manolos Aviation, a helicopter company based in Ley. The gate was forcefully opened by the women to allow a medivac by Manolos from Tap Tap in Kabum district to Ley. How, this, how do these people in the higher authority feel about the women and children, men and everyone in the remotest area that don't have health access? Now, Amy bed, that is very bad. Them one player wrote them stop or say, Larry, please, Larry, the gate must open. On Monday this week, Elizabeth Bradshaw, the CEO of Morobe Sustainable Investment Limited, a business arm of Morobe Provincial Government, ordered the security guards to weld shut this access gate. In a phone interview with Bradshaw this afternoon, she claimed that Manolos Aviation is illegally occupying the area. She said the gate was welded shut following a court order last month. Almost 20 minutes later, the helicopter landed with the patient, a pregnant woman with her dead baby still in her belly. This is all the line inside the remote and rural area, all to make up man with this time. The you may have a town inside the town, can you make a car and a ship in the city? Inside the remote area and rural area, you know that car and a ship can go. So the only way we are working is service and through the manalos. The women said, there shouldn't be any obstructions in saving lives of the people of Morbe, especially women and children from Morbe's remote areas. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. Port Moresby now has sufficient power supply, enough to supply the whole city uninterrupted following the launching of the Dirio gas and power plant yesterday. The 350 million kina investment by LNG landowners through MRDC was opened by the Prime Minister last night. The Dirio Power will supply 45 megawatts to the Port Moresby grid, adding to PNG Power's 80 megawatts and New Power's 58 megawatts. The journey to have a gas power plant outside Port Mosby started in 2018 when government delegates and landowners knocked on the doors of solar turbines in the U.S. to help make their dream come true. Two years later, a multi-million kina infrastructure now stands at Papalelea, owned by the landowners of PNG LNG, all through their trusty company. Mineral Resource Development Company. And the investment is about 350 million kina, uh, including all the COVID costs. It's not easy to operate in the last one year. I'm sure everybody you know with the price of oil down and all those who are in the construction business, it's very difficult to operate. But we are one of the only few businesses that have been operating you know, in this tough, difficult times. 
called the Derogation Power. This project is also good news for Port Mosby power consumers. This power plant will add 45 megawatts of clean energy to the Port Mosby grid. With new power already providing clean power to the same grid, PNG Power's dependency on diesel turbines will be minimized. Port Mosby now has enough power supply to power the old city. However, PNG Power is now faced with the challenge of upgrading its aging transmission infrastructure in order to transmit power. Dirio Power signed a power purchase agreement with PNG Power in September 2019, agreeing to supply electricity at a price lower than other third-party suppliers. Dirio aims to deliver cheaper power, making electricity more affordable. The low price could potentially lead to a reduction in tariff for electricity users in the capital city. It is up to PNG Power to fix the transmission and retail and pass the savings to the customers. Prime Minister James Marape said his government believes in domestic business capacity and congratulated MRDC for making this investment decision. If we get it correct for the landowners, the landowners' investments has a multiplier effect in our economy and in our country. So thank you very much for everyone who had a belief in a landowner business stepping up the notch, migrating away from what is usually the predominant landowner businesses and moving up one notch higher. I have absolute belief, faith and confidence in not just landowner companies, but Papua New Guinea companies. With Port Mosby grid now fully supplied, plans are to build a similar facilities in the Hela province. ExxonMobil pledged its support to ensure Ally is lit up by its own gas. After the other, I know with the next one, we get Port Mosby right, the next one is Hela. We've got gas. You need to work on your chairman about decreasing the tax a little bit so I can help you out on the price. And then we can could, we could have a deal. Meantime, Prime Minister Marape challenged PNG Power to pass on this benefit to customers in the city. Ruth Rongola, National MTV News. Wafi Gopal gold mine in the Morbe province is one step closer to a special mining lease. The state yesterday announcing the environmental impact statement had been approved after months of negotiations between the Morbe provincial government who had put a stop to talks after landowners raised concerns on the method used for disposing mine waste. Developers Harmony and Newcrest will now move forward in applying for the special mining lease. The Wafugopu Copper Gold Mine Project environmental permit talks came to a standstill when landowners of the six impacted areas petitioned the government through the Morabe Provincial Government on the disposal method of mine waste. The landowners are against the proposed deep sea tailing disposal because of the impact it will have on the marine life in the long run. Yesterday, Prime Minister James Marabe announced that the environmental impact statement has been granted by SIPA. Uh, my government took it serious to take heed and listen to uh, Lenona consents as well as listen to provincial government consents who, uh, which is the government closest to the people. It has taken us 18 months since being in office but we have now have arrived at a state in as far as Wapi Golpu project is concerned for us to progress to approval in principle in as far as environmental permit is concerned. Prime Minister James Marpe thanking the Moraba Provincial Government for their push in the best interest of the people and stated that disposal methods were re-looked. Issues in as far as telling storage facility conversations will still run with us and Moraba Provincial Government and their team uh, are going to bring these proposals to us in the next phase of conversation with them. This now gives us opportune time for us to sit with every party on the table and for us to open this dialogue again and we will move into the next phase as I did indicate earlier. Moreby Governor Ginson Saunu welcoming the news while apologizing to the developers for the delay but stating it was in the best interest of the people. not encounter problems that we experience with existing minings in the country and that's the whole idea. And so I'm happy. Um, from now on, um, I would like to also apologize uh, to our developers. They spend their money. Uh, I would like to uh, sincerely apologize um, Harmony and Newcrest uh, for all that happened because we have to speak 
for the people. And it's good exercise to hear from the leaders so that instead of people come straight to you, uh, we, we, we made it possible for you to stand at the back and let the, let the leaders uh, you know, represent the people and uh, you, know, you listen to us. And you have been patient, so I would like to thank uh, Harmony and Newcrest for your patience. Meanwhile, Environment Minister Wera Morris said with his experience as a geologist, he looked forward to the prospect that Wafa Gopu Mine would bring to the country. With the support of the national government, uh, the Morobe Provincial government, the Morobe Provincial government's 10% equity, which will also comprise both gold and copper, may be smelted and refined. We may start off by basically doing a small operations and then eventually as the as the business increases, that will be the opportunity that we will be basically based on for future downstream processing in the country. Adelaide Xerox Kari National, MTV News. A chartered flight flew into Vanimo today with members of the opposition camp. On board, the member for Yalibu Pangia, Peter O'Neill, together with member for Good Enough Tag Douglas Tomoriesa and Milne Bay Governor Lou Critton. They were received by a number of other leaders who had defected to the opposition since the last parliament sitting, presided by Deputy Speaker Connie Iguan. The atmosphere in Vanimo is calm and expectant. This can be seen by the numbers on the ground. During a head count and photo shoot, opposition leader Belda Nama spoke confidently on their move to form a new government. Other members shared similar sentiments, including member for Bulolo and defected Deputy Prime Minister Sam Basil. It's bigger than Belda Nama, it's bigger than James Marape, it's bigger than Sam Basil, and it's bigger than respect from senior members of parliament, senior ministers, the number one lawmaker of the country, the attorney general. There is no, there is no need for you to hang on to and try to fight. And if you fight, you are fighting a losing battle, my friend. I ask you to do the right thing by the people of this country. Number shifted, resigned today. Thank you and God save our country. We want a good government. We want a government that respects institutions. We want a government that respects everything, like Charles has put it. We have increased the overdraft facility, the TF facility, from 300 million to 1.2 billion. Without realizing, we might be funding our deficit budget from that money instead of covering wages every fortnight that we normally run short of money, because money is nowadays is hard to come by. So. We have many reasons why we walked across. The numbers are here and the government is here. We look forward to have a new government. We look forward to have a good government. And we look forward to deliver census next year in 2022. We want a fair election for all people in Papua New Guinea. Meanwhile, the application by the member for Yalibu Pangia and former Prime Minister Peter O'Neill challenging the parliamentary events that unfolded earlier this week went before Chief Justice Sir Gibbs Salika this morning. Peter O'Neill had withdrawn his initial application after the government successfully passed the 2021 budget on Tuesday. The application was lodged again on Wednesday. Today, lawyers representing all parties were in court. However, some of the defendant's lawyers said they were not served the court files. Chief Justice Sir Gibbs Salika adjourned the matter to next Wednesday. He told lawyers to speed up their work so this case can be dealt quickly. Meanwhile, the opposition leader's application challenging the legality of the process in which James Marape was elected Prime Minister was also adjourned to next Monday for hearing on Nama's standing. Among stories after the break, a project rolled out in Eastern Highlands to keep girls in school and this weekend's Pineapple Festival in Central Province to showcase the rich culture of the people. Stay with us for the details.
Welcome back to the news. Your next 111 call might be in vain as the only national ambulance service in Papua New Guinea will not be able to help you. St. John Ambulance PNG has completely missed out on the 2021 budget. They may have to cut back on expenses and that could mean grounding some ambulances, leaving the public without medical help. St. John Ambulance PNG has completely missed out from the 2021 budget as the only national ambulance service that offers free emergency pre-hospital care that is a concern. Plus we understand that there is many priorities in health and particularly we're passionate like many in seeing improvements in rural health care. Our concern came from, for the patients that we serve and there's over 10,000 patients that we serve with 100 professionally trained ambulance officers. Unlike many district ambulances, a St. John ambulance is fully kitted with life-saving equipment from oxygen tank to nebulizer for asthma patients and a non-pneumatic anti-shock garment to help mothers who are losing a lot of blood after giving birth. The ambulance charges only 30 kina for emergencies involving motor vehicles, snake bites, pregnancy-related and children under five. No fee is charged. The real cost of using all the equipment in the ambulance, including medicine plus the fuel cost and the ambulance officers, is more than 30 kina. It's over a grand. The cost of the ambulance service is usually subsidized by the national government funding and fundraising drives. Chief of Emergency Medicine, Dr. Sev Yokopua, who has been instrumental in assisting St. John to extend the service to other parts of the country, is appealing to the government to consider the ambulance service. St. John has a committed group of ambulance officers, nurses, HEOs, paramedics and doctors committed to providing life-saving pre-hospital care to patients. With this uncertainty from the government, their future is also in question. St. John Ambulance operates a 24-hour ambulance service and call centre. Currently, they are operating in NCD Central and East New Britain Province. They are expanding services to Leigh and Medang soon. For centres yet to have the ambulance service, trained ambulance officers at the call centre are on standby to provide first aid advice over the phone. Shamin Poreambeb, National MTV News. Special hygiene facilities are being built throughout schools in Groka District to create a conducive environment for young girls who are at the age of their monthly cycle. Through the menstrual hygiene program that is being rolled out in selected schools, UNICEF PNG aims to give female students equal chances to get educated and minimize discrimination. Under this program, schools are seeing an increase in the enrollment for girls. Hold it. Yeah. You tie it. Yeah. Implemented under the European Union funded water, sanitation and health or wash program, these improvements are desired to encourage young girls to come to school. UNICEF Chief of Wash, Carlos Washkes, is in Goroka District to officiate at these facilities designed to accommodate UNICEF's menstrual hygiene management programs in schools. We are working with Oxfam to implement the hygiene component of the project, and Oxfam is working with TTU as an implementing partner. Um, this was supposed to be a joint review meeting uh, where government counterparts uh, we're able to see um, the activities implemented so far on the ground, uh, see progress, uh, see some of the challenges which have resulted in some delays. Bilata Jawara, a grade seven student at Ufeto Primary, says the inclusion of proper change rooms gives students like herself the privacy needed when it's that time of the month. Where first 
a study conducted by UNICEF in 2018 involving 136 schools in Papua New Guinea found that 46% of girls stayed away from classes during their menstruation. Na block for all girls here we have this uh, incinerator where only can uh, burn them all rubbish blow all. Now we have the shower inside as well. All was was. All clean all yet now come out. This has contributed to low academic performances by adolescent girls a challenge that the Education Department is trying to address at the national level. So time all stop three days, four days, or one week all stop long, plus time all stop long, six months, quality education I'm not got. In primary schools where students have limited knowledge on menstrual hygiene, it is very difficult for young girls who are at the age of menstruating. Though puberty is taught to both boys and girls in classes, the actual installation of such facilities will minimize the amount of days young girls stay away from classes due to menstruation. Thekla Gunga, National MTV News, Goroka. Two sisters from Enga province are the ducks of grade 10 and 12 at Notre Dame Secondary School in Western Highlands province. Charity and Christy Malu told MTV News that they had worked hard to get good marks so that they can have good jobs in future. The all-girls Catholic school held its 51st grade 10 and 16th grade 12 graduation yesterday. President. The elder sister and outgoing school president of Notre Dame Secondary School, Christy Malou, said being a political lawyer is her dream that she would one day want to achieve. Christy received prizes in legal studies, history, math and economics, including the leadership awards and the Dark of social science class. Like her big sister, Charity Malou received prizes in all the eight subjects and the grade 10 Ducks Award. I want to become a lawyer, so that's why I went to history class and I took up history and yeah. Invited guests spoke highly of women who have excelled in their career paths despite all odds, as well as reminding girls of the increased number of gender-based violence and teenage pregnancies. The graduates were encouraged to pursue education and do not settle for motherhood jobs. Don't be discouraged. This is not the end of the life, end of your life. Don't be that discouraged. There are other options available. Look at yourself. What do you have? What resources do you have? What skills do you have? And try to work on it. Archbishop Douglas Young urged the graduates to put God first and education second to prosper in life. Graduates were also encouraged to choose other career paths in the technical colleges, vocational schools or TVETs to learn technical and life skills training to meet the increasing demand. Far more inclusive, to be far more nurturing, to reach out once again more in a more concentrated way to those who are excluded. Notre Dame Secondary is one of the performing schools in the province and the country. They were listed under the top 11 secondary schools in the country last year. Us, day by day, year by year, in a joy and happiness. Graduates, go with the spirit of Notre Dame. Vasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. So Gary in the central province is set to host the first ever pineapple festival. The two-day event beginning tomorrow will showcase the rich culture of the Koyari people and incorporates fun and games hosted mainly at the Yarrawari sporting field. The excitement already building up to tomorrow's event. So Gary's very own show for the first time. This event is a pineapple festival and it's a two-day event on Saturday and Sunday, and each day is given different activities uh, 
together for the weekend. The event to come together at Yarrawari. The, there's a field as you go past uh, Yarrawari. Uh, there's a field on your left. Uh, the event is taking place there. From the mountains to the plateaus, the entire Koyari is expected to descend onto one location. The rich culture, food and fruits to take center stage. There is also the added fun and games like the 9 kilometer long enduro challenge. And that activity is, uh, it comes under triathlon sports where you swim, cycle and run. Unfortunately for the event on Saturday will not be a swimming, but it's going to be kayaking. So they will do kayak, uh, cycle and run. Bradley Valenaki, National MTV News. And now looking at the NAS fund market report, the Kina closed unchanged at 0 0.2850 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0 0.2775 US dollars, 0 0.3772 Australian dollars, 0 0.2256 euro and 28.13 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York closed gold is trading higher, coffee, cocoa and copper closed higher. Crude oil is trading lower, palm oil closed lower and copper closed higher. And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 44.81 points higher. The ASX 200 is trading at 8.03 points lower and the All Ordinaries is trading at 2.76 points lower. And National MTV News continues with more after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. A man in his 20s from Maprik in the East Sipik province was found dead by his in-laws in the early hours of this morning. Police believe the man was murdered last night. His body was found in an isolated spot at Weir village in the Rikos district. Reports gathered at the crime scene established that on Thursday afternoon, the deceased was with at least three men at N10 in Ward 14 of Estrella Baby LLG, Rikos District. An argument erupted within the group. In the morning, the deceased was found dead at Weir Village in Ward 13. His body is now at the Medang Provincial Hospital morgue. Police are investigating the incident with one prime suspect already identified. The Department of Provincial and Local Level Government Affairs has partnered with Pacific Institute of Leadership and Governance to roll out various training programs in provinces. Through this partnership, PLAG will be offering competency-based training to both DPLGA officers and officers from provincial government and district development authorities based at district levels. It also supports the department's efforts in preparing the provinces for decentralization. To signify the start of this partnership, a memorandum of understanding was signed in Kimbe, West New Britain province recently. This mutual understanding paves way for PILAG to offer competency-based training to officers from the Department of Provincial and Local Level Government Office, including institutions at sub-national level. It also supports the department's efforts in preparing provinces for decentralization. This initiative will greatly complement and support DPLJ's efforts in preparing provinces for greater de decentralization. More significantly, it will strengthen the confidence and trust subnational governments and institutions have on DPLJ's leadership and strategic directions and the role that the plasma plays in oversight of all reform and capacity building initiatives. As a government institution, PILAG has been providing competency-based training to various government departments and offices at sub-national levels. In partnership with the Australian government, several courses were offered to offices from various provinces and districts. This has helped them to identify certain skills gap at sub-national level. And through this partnership, courses will be offered to train public service offices to help build capacity and improve performance. When you go to the district and provinces out there, they will say that we do, do not know about these policies. And they even do not know how to realign with their policies, where the funding and everything will come. So we are working together to help put them into training. We will be going out to district and provinces to train. 
Apart from offering competency-based training, Pilag is also mentoring young public servants to become good leaders. According to the CEO, they have identified young public servants from the age of 25 to 35 from all regions to train. And what we are doing today is we are identifying young public servants in the districts in the provinces at the ages of 35 to uh, 25 to 35 and we are training them giving them capacity so that they become leaders in the provinces and districts as part of the mou signing a total of 50,000 kina was presented to pilag to support this training next year dplga secretary dixon guina hopes to see more of such initiative to support provinces and districts going forward rayon lakingu national mtv news Natrika Sports is next. Here's Fidele Sukina with more updates on the SBPNG Hunters. Yes, Helen, the Hunters hope to recruit players down under when they relocate. We'll bring you the details in Trukai Sports after the break. Stay with us. Tukai Sports. And welcome to Tukai Sports. The SP PNG Hunters will be relocating to the Sunshine Coast in Queensland and for convenience sake will be looking to PNG Heritage players for assistance throughout the season. And there is a likelihood of some Queensland-based PNG Kumus players joining the side in the 2021 season. With the SPPNG Hunters already planning their relocation to the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, they are faced with a dilemma where they will have to look at sourcing players from Queensland. Hunters coach Matthew Church says while they are looking to have a squad of 30 to be brought down to the sunny coast, they will need more than that for the full course of the season. I'm trying to work around a squad number of about 30 to, to relocate to Queensland. Um, in a normal Intra Super Cup season, uh, they generally use between 35 and 40 players. So where do I find that extra five to 10 players? So um, being back home and having that opportunity to be in South East Queensland and visit the facilities that we've been looking at and all that sort of stuff um, allowed me to work on support systems for our people. Chad says without disrupting the concept of the Hunters being a PNG Rugby League pathway program, he will be looking to players with PNG heritage. If I need players, how do I find them? Because um, you know it's not an easy process to just send one over from PNG if they've got to go through two weeks quarantine and all that sort of stuff. So um, I don't want to in any way, shape or form dilute what the Hunter stands for and that's a pathway for PNG people. Um, so I, I will be looking into PNG heritage players um, that are based in, in Queensland. So The likelihood of PNG representative players from the Kumuls team based in Queensland Joining the club is being considered as well, with Church in talks with several Kumu reps in Queensland on best options going forward. So I've reached out to a number of PNG um, heritage Queensland based players. So I spoke to, to Dan, to Kyle and to Luke Page about how they can help, you know, not necessarily playing for us, but um, that, it, that option is on the table. We will explore that if we, if we, if we can. We, we would want those guys, whether they're playing for us or just coming down to support our guys. So Luke uh, lives in South East Queensland, so he said on, his, on the weekends off and there's going to be five bye weekends across the season for next year. So he said he's happy to come and be around the boys and, and help them transition into Australian life. Relocating to the Sunshine Coast under a COVID bubble had been done by the New Zealand Warriors this season in the NRL and Church says he had reached out to former Warriors coach Todd Payton on what worked well for the team and what best practices the Hunters can adopt. I've reached out to Todd Payton and discussed a few things, what he thought worked, what didn't work for, for the relocation of the Warriors. Um, he gave me some great insights into that. So um, I've been doing as much research and, and, and work on that side of the aspects and we've been looking into education or, or work placement opportunities while they are in South East Queensland. It provides tremendous opportunities that you know might not be afforded to some of those guys that if they're just based back in PNG. 
And Trokai Sports continues with sailing and boxing after the break. Don't go away. Trokai Sports. And welcome back to Trukai Sports. To sailing abroad, Team New Zealand has taken flight for the first time in Auckland's harbour today after her unveiling last night and she was put straight to the test. A couple of hours into Terehu Tai's debut sail and a hint of the drama that could unfold over the next few months. <laughs> Team New Zealand coming to grips with their new toy and already they're showing she's got some serious pace. Flying over Auckland's Waitemata Harbour in less than 10 knot winds. At the moment we're doing about 40 knots to be able to keep up with Team New Zealand in these light winds. They're picking up some pretty fast speeds. Just how fast Terehu Tai can really go remains a secret, but so far she's getting the thumbs up from all the crew. We've probably exceeded our expectations a little bit, you know, to be able to scout and do some, some nice manoeuvres and a good bit of breeze and, you know, the boat felt really nice. Team New Zealand is the last syndicate to finally unveil their secret weapon a month behind the other challenges. While their new race ready rig may initially look similar to their prototype Tiahi, it's anything but. Terehu ties a serious upgrade. Today's great for the sailing team, obviously great for the whole team to see the boat out there flying, doing its thing after a heck of a lot of work for from so many people to get to this point. It was the star attraction today with rival syndicates trying to get that first glimpse of just how the new Kiwi design operates. Also out for a close inspection, boaties and even party goers. Good to be this close to it. I'm sure we'll be out for close to the time when it's when they're racing as well. Sailed past all the other ones on my wind foil in the last three months. So I can't wait to see how our one go. I'm sure it'll be faster. With the Christmas regatta less than a month away, the cup is now well and truly taking flight. The heavyweight boxing bout between Joseph Parker and Junior Farr has suddenly been postponed. Farr has been struggling to perform during training for weeks before his blood test revealed he needed urgent surgery. Years ago, Junior Farr suffered from a condition that blocked oxygen flowing through his body, causing a huge loss in energy. He had minor surgery and was fine until two weeks ago. We saw some problems last week with his training. Um, there was a uh, drop-off in performance. His camp says a blood test on Friday discovered an issue, but won't confirm if it's linked to his earlier condition. It will require more surgery and an overnight stay in hospital on Tuesday. Is it the same thing or you've found something else? Uh, we've found something else, yeah. Okay. Um, it might be related to what it was before. I do know some details and, and I know that it's going to be fixed once and for all via the surgery, so I'm confident. Confidence. Both camps agreed to postpone the bout until next year, but when exactly depends on Farr's recovery. Medical professionals are saying that this operation is going to fix the problem and then in one month he'll be ready to go into camp again. What's your gut feeling around when it will happen? Well, it's kind of going to be anywhere between three and seven months, say, you know. As always, when anything happens in the world of boxing, you have to look at who is benefiting the most. There's no funny business, it's definitely this blood issue. Oh, we're not going to talk about it, eh? No. <laughs> so I think Joseph Parker is going to unleash fury on Junior Farr when we get there early next year. Don't rule out a few more twists and turns before then. And that story wraps up True Guy Sports. Helen will be back with the weather report for the next 24 hours. Enjoy your weekend in sports. Good night. True Kai Sports. True Kai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Cloudy morning clearing to a fine day with evening thunderstorms and showers likely in Port Moresby. Morning rain drizzles, then cloudy, then fine in Daru and Popandita. Fine, although partly cloudy with afternoon showers developing in Kerama and partly cloudy with some rain showers later in Alutao. In the Mamasa region, fine, partly cloudy with afternoon showers developing in Lei. Mostly fine, partly cloudy with afternoon showers developing in Middang as well. 
Mostly cloudy with easing thundery showers in Wewak and occasional rain showers and thunderstorms in Vanimore. In the New Guinea Islands region, morning showers then fine, cloudy in Lorengau. Rain showers and thunderstorms easing to cloudy periods in KVN, Kokopo and Rabaul. Occasional rain showers and thunderstorms easing to cloudy periods in Kimbe and Buka. And in the Highlands region, morning fog clearing to fine, partly cloudy with evening showers, then drizzles in Mount Hagen. Morning fog patches clearing, mostly fine, although partly cloudy with evening drizzles in Goroka and Kundiawa. And morning fog clearing to fine, cloudy weather with evening rain drizzles likely in Mendi and Wabeg. The weather update was proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. And that's the way it is this Friday, the 20th of November 2020. On behalf of the entire news team, enjoy your weekend. Good night.